So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Ware and I'm the director of the Basel Peace Office. Uh, the welcome was uh, supposed to be given by Andy Niedecker, uh, who is the president of the Basel Peace Office and the founder of the uh, Pacey Award. Uh, but unfortunately, he's having some technical problems uh, joining us today. So I'll give the welcome instead. Uh, and a thank you very much to uh, the distinguished speakers who we have uh, both in session one and session two today, and to uh, the finalists for the Pacey Youth Award, which will be in session three. Uh, and so today is very much about intergenerational dialogue on these key issues for humanity, peace, the climate action, uh, sustainable development, uh, disarmament, and particularly in times of pandemic, and the connections between these. The inspiration that's coming from young people and some of the experience from those who have been involved in policy making uh, and building cooperation uh, between uh, younger people and uh, people who have been engaged for longer um, across these, these topics. So again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we're very happy that uh, the sessions are being moderated primarily by our young people uh, from Basel Peace Office and Youth Fusion. And, uh, and that we're also uh, doing this in cooperation with the presidential department of the Basel City uh, Canton or Basel Start Canton. Uh, and it's been done also in conjunction with an annual event, which the Basel Start Canton organizes in cooperation with Swiss Peace which is called the Basel Peace Forum. And that starts tomorrow and runs for a couple of days and has experts in the field coming together to examine and advance key policies. So we're very happy to have this event associated with the Basel Peace Forum uh, in cooperation with the Basel Start Canton uh, and also with some of the partner organizations for the Basel Peace Office. So with that, I'll pass over to Lucas Ott uh, who is uh, from the uh, presidential department uh, of the Basel Start Canton uh, to give some uh, opening comments. Uh, Lucas, you have the floor. Thank you, dear Ellen, dear Wanda, dear speakers of the three sessions, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the Youth Forum and PACI Plus Youth Award. In this day and age, there are many good reasons and objectives for us to address actions and effective policies for peace, disarmament, the climate, and especially in times of the pandemic, as Alan mentioned, to public health. Especially in few of the current global situation with many uncertain political situations due to the COVID pandemic situation and the rise of autocratic political regimes, the promotion of peace movements and the holistic understanding of peace is important. Peace contains more than absence of war and violent conflicts. Peace requires a situation in which social justice and inclusion, equal rights, security, and the rule of law prevail, in which participation is possible and in which sustainable development can take place. From my perspective as an urban developer, peace is the foundation of a prospering city. Peace and security are the central starting points on the path to sustainable development. Peace is the foundation that something good can grow out of it. Our goal must be to create a world free of nuclear weapons. For these reasons, Basel signed the ICAN Cities Appeal in 2020. And since 2000, 
and five, Basel is member city of the International Association Mayors for Peace, which strives for the global disarmament. But not only nuclear weapons are a peace threatening factor, also climate change has an important role when it comes to peace, especially in countries where climate change is amplifying social and political instability, peace building will be a challenging task in the future. The last decades showed that climate related security risk, risks increased the likelihood of violent conflicts. However, the impacts are temporally and spatially diverse. Different social, political, and economic contexts influence local peace building activities, activities and developments. In Basel, we are also noticing climate change and are trying to counteract the negative effects of the well being of the population and the environment is a climate concept. Further approaches and actions will be necessary in the future to avoid negative effects of climate change on peace. Finally, yet importantly, health and social cohesion have stabilizing effects on peace. But the current COVID pandemic is a challenge for peace. The virus threatens people of different countries in a different way, and the measures taken are causing different economic losses worldwide. The underlying roots of conflict, especially inequality, are exacerbated. Therefore, ongoing peace processes are jeopardized. The fact that peace is never an asset that can be taken for granted, granted is emphasized once again. Youth-led projects and activities that promote peace, climate protection and disarmament are more important than ever. I'm therefore very pleased to open this Intergenerational Forum on Peace, Climate, Nuclear Disarmament and Pandemic Issues, and to present a PACI Europe Award at the end of the forum. I'm particularly grateful to the Basel Peace Office, the Youth Fusion, and to many committed individuals for having made this event possible. Thank you very much. Lucas, thank you very much for your uh, opening comments. And again, a huge thank you from uh, us at the Basel Peace Office to the President's Department of the uh, Basel Start Canton uh, for the support for this event, uh, for the support for the PASI, uh, a youth award uh, and also for uh, being the co-sponsor of the Basel Peace Forum which is as I mentioned is taking place uh, for over the next couple of days um, and it's an annual event bringing in uh, experts in the field. I'm very pleased to see now that uh, Professor Dr Andreas Niedecker, a president of the Basel Peace Office, has managed to uh, come on. So I'll now pass over uh, to uh, Dr Niedecker uh, to give some words of welcome and then uh, to introduce the moderator for the session, Dr Niedecker. Dear uh, Lucas, uh, dear Alan, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is my pleasure as president of the Basel Peace Office and member of the organizing committee to welcome you today most cordially. We have received registrations from 180 people in 40 countries and uh, some 20 youth groups have participated in, uh, in the event and uh, have participated with their projects. 
whether we are from Basel or live far away, we are all, all equal in front of the computer screen. And uh, uh, while meeting face to face surely is more enjoyable, uh, it is a lot more cheaper and it is easier to gather a big number of people. And this fact, uh, Zoom uh, or any other uh, adapted uh, social programs allow not just to reduce costs, but they also speed up diffusion of ideas and hopefully promote subsequent audience, uh, su subsequent action. Um, this first part of this meeting will focus on key political goals and actions of youth groups. In the second part, contributions by experienced uh, politicians and scientists uh, uh, will be presented. Their professional know-how, motivation and experience will hopefully motivate many of you and perhaps teach you a few tricks how to achieve a particular goal with your projects. Uh, I now hand over uh, and thank uh, Lukas Ott for his words. I now hand over the chair to Wanda Proskova from the Czech Republic. She is the vice chair of Prague Vision and uh, the Institute for Sustainable Security and the co-convener of the new organization Use Fusion. Wanda, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. And again, welcome everyone uh, to session one. Um, thank you both gentlemen for the welcome words and we're also looking forward to seeing you both at the Pacey Awards in session three. So everyone stay tuned for that. But I think there has been enough of introductions for now. So let's jump right in the first session. The first out of the three we have planned for today. So the first panel will provide an introduction to the issues of peace, disarmament, climate and public health. Again, as Alan has mentioned, especially important in the times of the never ending pandemic seemingly, uh, but it will also introduce some key political goals and actions of youth. Session two will then take a look at how we can turn the visions and energy of youth into effective political action and policy change. And then finally, in session three, we'll hear from the finalists of the PC Awards and we'll get to choose the winners. Um, everything is here under the same link, so you don't have to go anywhere. Each session will be one hour and 15 minutes long and there will be 15 minute breaks in between. So um, there is a lot to cover and look a lot to look forward to. And in this specific panel, we will hear presentations by three young activists from the climate action, nuclear disarmament and peace and sustainable development fields. Each speaker has up to eight minutes of time to present and the panel will be followed by a discussion. So on that note, if you have any general comments, any links or ideas that you would like to share, please free, feel free to use the chat tool within Zoom or if you're watching on Facebook, just comment it there. We'll try to monitor that and then pass it on to the panelists. If you have any specific question for any specific panelists or speakers in this session, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, this way we'll be able to find them easily and then our panelists and speakers will be able to answer them at the end of this session. So having that all cleared up, um, I'd like to introduce the first speaker of today's panel. Uh, the first speaker is Marjan Nurjan from Kazakhstan originally. Uh, she is the woman of many roles, my amazing colleague, co convener of Youth Fusion, Abolition 2000 Youth Network, also PNND coordinator for CIS countries and member of the CTBTO Youth Group. So without further ado, Marjan, the floor is yours. Thank you for kind introduction, Wanda. I'm going to share my screen and greetings to um, everybody, to all the participants, uh, as well as to the panelists. Just uh, a second, I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if you can um, see it. Perfectly. Mm -hmm. And you can see it uh, in a full size, right? Yes. Good, thank you. 
So thanks again. Uh, my name is Mashan, and I'm going to present you today uh, on the topic of youth engagement uh, and nuclear issues. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned before, I'm a co-convener of the Abolition 2000 Youth Network, which is now being rebranded to a new name of Youth Fusion. Uh, and previously, it was a working group of Abolition 2000, which is a, a global network uh, for abolition of nuclear arms. Uh, and um, let me give you um, some short information about uh, the youth network. So it's a worldwide uh, networking platform for uh, young individuals and uh, organizations in the field of nuclear disarmament, um, non-proliferation as well as risk reduction. Uh, it focuses uh, on youth action and intergenerational dialogue, which I would like to highlight uh, building on the links between disarmament, peace, climate, um, sustainable development, and also uh, paying attention to the current uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, our goals are to inform, educate, connect, and engage our fellow students, uh, activists, enthusiasts, anybody who is interested in the topic. Uh, and through these activities, uh, as a part of the global network uh, of Abolition 2000, we contribute to the total elimination of uh, nuclear weapons. I would like to uh, show you some of the examples of our um, previous um, uh, actions, activities, projects, uh, and I would like to emphasize that this is only some of them and more of this uh, on the um, the current projects and activities you can find on our website, uh, usefusion.org. Uh, and um, in my uh, presentation, I would like to uh, cover nuclear um, disarmament uh, and uh, various uh, ways of uh, engaging uh, public and not only young people as such. So in this picture, you can see the 3D nuke missile arts, which is an interactive exhibition um, and raising awareness of public um, by this type of uh, action uh, is something um, which was held for the first time in front of the uh, German parliament building in Reichstag. Uh, in the first picture, in the second picture, um, the strategic missile arts was um, uh, exhibited uh, during the international uh, use uh, conference in Prague and Czech Republic. We also have um, some social media actions, and this is just one of the examples. Uh, it's pretty simple and easy of, for example, holding uh, a peace sign and taking picture and using some hashtags. It also helps to uh, generate the social media um, interest as well as um, involvement using these technologies. Another um, activity is the film screening as well as uh, discussion. Uh, in this picture, you can see uh, the first uh, screening of the uh, documentary called Where the Wind Blew in Kazakhstan uh, in the capital of Astana in 2018, which uh, featured um, Karibia Kuyukov, uh, who is the second uh, victim generation of the nuclear testing, um, who was born in the area of the Simulpalizens nuclear test site. And he is also an honorary ambassador of the Atom Project, as well as an artist, although without arms, an anti-nuclear uh, activist. And uh, it was a great way of um, having a discussion and dialogue with people and just to get to know more about the uh, topic of uh, nuclear weapons testing, as well as the humanitarian and environmental consequences and the transgenerational impact of that. Um, and some of the uh, activities as well of uh, the International Youth Conference in Prague, which I have mentioned before. Uh, it um, united uh, participants from uh, 20 uh, countries uh, and uh, we have had um, various discussions uh, and deliberations which were reflected in the youth appeal uh, adopted uh, as an outcome of the International Youth Conference. And in the picture you can see uh, our um, field trip uh, to one of the nuclear weapons uh, storages from the Soviet Union times uh, based in Czech Republic, uh, close to uh, the city of Prague, which is now turned into a museum. Um, another way of um, having nuclear disarmament uh, on connected um, 
to various other topics as well as uh, levels of engagement is the, the cities. So in cooperation with the Mayors for Peace, uh, there is a flag day which is being commemorated every July 8th. Uh, and this day was chosen um, in connection to the uh, International Court of Justice advisory opinion on nuclear weapons, on the illegality of the threat or use of the nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, here is the mixture of the 3D nuke missile arts um, being again exhibited uh, in the streets of the German cities. And here you can see some of the snapshots from that experience. So uh, engaging young people is uh, of course uh, important, uh, especially in the topic of nuclear disarmament, which is a part of the global uh, security and peace matters. Uh, and here I would like to um, uh, highlight two of the uh, significant uh, documents. Uh, of course, there are other um, mm, uh, documents as well, which have uh, importance, but these ones are specifically focused on the topic of uh, use, um, disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control. For example, this was um, the um, United Nations uh, General Assembly resolution in 2019, which was adopted on specifically um, engaging young people in the topic, as well as providing uh, opportunities for meaningful participation. Uh, and the United Nations Secretary General Agenda for Disarmament, uh, which is based on four pillars, uh, and one of them is highlighting the role of uh, disarmament for future generations, um, emphasizing that present and future generations have a right to live uh, in a world which is free of nuclear weapons, as well as uh, peaceful, just, and sustainable. And just to have a retrospective of the uh, protests which happened um, 40 years ago in uh, 1982, uh, and uh, now uh, we see how uh, millions of people uh, in the streets of New York uh, protested uh, against nuclear arms and uh, advocated for peace, for ending wars and conflicts, uh, and how this picture has changed uh, to now when um, millions of children uh, and young people, they are protesting worldwide uh, and um, claiming for uh, actions on climate change. And here, um, I guess, is the, one of the uh, problems as well as solutions um, in terms of demographics, as well as the um, intergenerational gap that exists between uh, young people and seniors, we see that uh, a lot of seniors are being uh, involved in the issue of nuclear disarmament, whereas uh, there are less young people represented. Uh, and the opposite picture uh, in relation to climate change, when we see a lot of young people as well as children um, claiming their uh, future, uh, which is um, again, uh, sustainable. Uh, and the climate change is being tackled. Um, and I believe that um, young people are actually uh, also a solution as well, because young people can serve as bridge builders. Uh, and in general, youth is um, being involved in a variety of the issues, which are uh, about the global challenges uh, and two of the world challenges that we are facing uh, for a long time are nuclear weapons and climate change. And of course, nowadays we have pandemic as well. And these issues um, demonstrate that we cannot look at the problems uh, separately in a polarized way, uh, which is very much fragmented, but rather we should see it in a interconnected way, intersectional way. And we do know that there are many um, uh, linkages between climate change, uh, as well as nuclear weapons, as well as the topic of public health. Uh, for example, the nuclear weapons testing uh, has uh, not only environmental, but also humanitarian consequences, and as well as transgenerational impact, which is passing from one generation to another. Uh, and the climate crisis, uh, if it's going to reach its uh, highest point, then there is a higher chance for probability of um, nuclear war, for example. Uh, and this uh, thing should be um, uh, seen through different uh, uh, 
uh, prisms, but in a very interconnected way. Uh, and um, I'm also a member of the CTPT youth group uh, and within uh, that group of uh, young professionals who are ad advocating for the entry into force of the global treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons testing. Uh, there is also uh, a group of uh, high level uh, senior professionals uh, who are called group of eminent uh, persons. Uh, and um, there is an um, opportunity as well for uh, having this intergenerational dialogue uh, which is also uh, being highlighted through the work of Abolition 2000, as well as the Youth Fusion. And uh, it's important that we do have this uh, dialogue channels and platforms in which uh, younger generation and seniors uh, can have open and frank discussions on the future, which is our common future. So with this, I would like to finish my presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marjan, for sharing that. And to all of you who have questions, again, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of this panel. Um, so as Marjan said, Youth Fusion is a global network. And we don't really focus on a specific region or a specific continent. Uh, we really try to cooperate with individuals and organizations really from around the globe. So it is really an honor for us to work with our next speaker, who comes from Cameroon, that's Davina Maloum. She is the founder of Children for Peace and also a winner of the prestigious International Children's Peace Prize in 2019. She is a huge inspiration to girls, not only in Africa, but globally. So Davina, it's a pleasure uh, to have you here and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Can you view? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, please, a minute. Okay, so Thank you very much for the flow. My name is Divina Malum. First of all, I would like to wish you all a, a happy new year. So my name is Malum Divina Stella. I am the founder of Children for Peace and the winner of the International Children's Peace Prize 2019. I first of all, I'd like to thank the almighty God who gave me the opportunity to be invited as a speaker in this international forum entitled Youth Action and Intergenerational Cooperation on Peace and Disarmament. So I'll first of all start by uh, introducing the practice of child soldiers, which is a worldwide phenomenon more expanded in Africa and in Cameroon. So according to the recent reports, there are approximately 300,000 child soldiers in the world, with African nations largely considered the highest hit by this practice. So far, these conflicts have involved thousands of children as combatants, mind testers, messengers, and cooks. Some of them have even been used as human shield or as sex slaves for military leaders. The sociopolitical context in Africa is characterized by an escalation of violence and insecurity perpetrated by terrorist groups like Boko Haram, al Shabaab, and the various affiliations of Al-Qaeda. The movement for unity and uh, jihad in West Africa and Ansadin. Cameroon, my country, is in the grip of multiple conflict by the Seleka and Anti-Balaka group from the Central African Rebellion. And uh, the north part of the country is attacked by terrorist groups known as Boko Haram and the Anglophone crisis specifically in Northwest and Southwest of Cameroon through a battle launched by separatist rebel for their own state asking for the separation of the country. In this presentation, we're going to showcase the conclusion of the studies my mate and I have been implementing on children to understand 
the reason for their recruitment as child soldiers and the psycho consequences of that recruitment. Before focusing on the contribution of children for democracy, human rights, and peace in the security crisis context in Africa. So, here we'll focus on the field study undertaken by Children for Peace on child soldiers in Central Africa. We'll present the target and scope of this field study. So, the field study my mate and I have been carrying out is entitled Child Soldiers in Central Africa from Children for War to Children for Peace, that is understanding the reason of child mainstreaming in armed groups and psychological consequences. So this study is running in the east, the far north, and the anglophone part of the country. It targets 25 groups of 50 children from Nigeria, Chad, Central African Republic, Ango Angola, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also Cameroon. Made up children, there, there are children, refugees, children who have belonged to armed groups, and uh, former bomb carriers who have been radicalized by Boko Haram. So the average age of the target group is 17 years old. Here we will present the key conclusions of the field studies. We will start by demonstrating one of the first observations of that study demonstrated um, when we were doing the field study. It shows that more than 50% of the population in Nigeria, Chad, Central African Republic, Angola, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Cameroon, conflict or post-conflict zone consists of children younger than 18 years old. One of the reasons for employing child soldiers is that they are viewed as expendable, replaceable, and they are cheap to maintain. Children now, they are also psychologically more vulnerable than many adults who already have a more shaped personality. Younger children in particular lack a sense of fear. They might be preferred over adults because they accept more dangerous tasks with scrutinizing them. Meanwhile, children's and adolescent identities are still being formed, meaning that they can be more easily influenced and controlled since they are dependent on protection and guidance. So as younger children in particular lack a sense of fear, they might be preferred over adults because they accept more dangerous taxes without scrutinizing them. Children and adolescent identities are still being formed, meaning that they can be easily influenced and controlled by terrorist groups. So here I'm going to show the percentage of the field study we carry on. We notice that uh, the majority of children involved in this armed conflict, 100% of them were forced to eat severe human suffering, so carriers of bombs. Here, we will focus mostly on the high percentage of children involved in this practice. Here too, we have um, more than 90% of um, children who are psychologically assaulted, kicked, beaten, and killed. So to present the situation, a total of 24% of the children report having killed someone and 28% report that they were forced to engage in sexual contact. We have 35% of the interviewed children have developed a fully developed post-traumatic stress disorder, a debate mental health disorder. And according to the study, many of those children were involved in sexual contact. So the question we need to ask now is what is the contribution of children for democracy, human rights, and peace in the security crisis context in Africa? So to address this horrible situation faced by children, mean, meaning that um, the study we have carried my mate and I on the field, so to present this horrible situation, we have uh, an association called Children for Peace that is a grassroots youth-led organization made up of teenager girls led who was strategy in based on the realization of documentaries on peace building, the creation and production of children peace cartoons. We have the organization of children capacity building workshop, the awareness raising campaign, the realization of studies on the ground, the creation of digital tools, and the psychosocial assistants have implemented a critical number of projects among them, we have silence the gun and the DDR tech, which is 
the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration technology for ex-child soldiers. So here, I'm going to present the project Silence the Gun. Yeah, on this image, you can see teenagers girls involved in the project Silence the Gun. So Silence the Gun is an integrated project with ambition is to contribute to address the causes and consequences of violent extremism and illicit proliferation of weapons. So this project aims at democratizing and reshaping the local governance and management of conflict, thereby liberating endogenous approaches and innovative solutions to build peace and improve child and children in affected areas by war. So here I'm going to present the key results of this project. I'm going to cite a few of them. We have 122 children capacitated on thematic related to peace building, violent extremism, and human rights, focusing on the children's rights, disarmament, and illicit proliferation of nuclear weapons. So far, we have seven peace clubs set in communities, and the capacity of 175 members built in leadership for peace building, conflict resolution, human rights, and gender equity. Also, we have uh, 50 children, including internally displaced children, refugees, uh, children who have been participating in Child March for Peace, entitled Ceasefire, which is Silence the Gun. Still, we also have two advocacy meetings gathering 50 local traditional and religious authorities that is state of official organized and on the matter related to child rights, demobilization, reintegration and disarmament of youth ex-combatants. We have kids' rights. We have the implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the UNSCR 2250 and 1325 that is related to youth and children participation in peace building and the fully implication of children in peace building. That is, we also have the fight against early and rough marriages. The importance, you know, of, um, sorry, to mobilize all stakeholders, including private sectors and multinationals to invest in girls and children education and youth employment. Still, on the key result related to the field studies, we have one sensitization meeting mobilizing 100 communities members including internally displaced people and refugees organized in five communities. We also have children's rights and uh, early marriages, the importance of the living together and peace building, the consequences of early marriages, the importance of disarmament, reintegration of children, and uh, the importance to fight against the illicit proliferation of weapons. Children and girls also, education is very important. We have two networks composed of at least 50 religious traditional leaders are set up and are working closely with the children to advance the silence, the guns project related to this issue. So still on that key, we also have um, 500 children, 50 local authorities and 300 community members directly involved in children's rights, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration of ex combatant as well as in the fight against violent extremism, radicalization, proliferation of weapons to the project. We also have two multi-stakeholders networks constituted by religious and traditional leaders and uh, children operationalized community sensitization and advocacies in villages, markets, schools, mosques, churches, and in local medias and on the internet that have touched at least 10,000 children than people among which 5,000 were teenagers. So this image is related to some capacity building session organized in peace building. Here too is another picture of the session organized in peace building by my mate and I. Here we're having an advocacy meeting with several traditional and religious leaders for inter-religious and intergenerational dialogue for peace building. Here we had an advocacy meeting with community leaders and parents to increase their commitment for children's rights during and after conflict. So we have the project entitled Disarmament, Mobilization and Reintegration Technology for Ex-Child Soldiers. 
Children for Peace has been working closely with the African Network of Young Leaders for Peace and Sustainable Development to develop an application called the DDR Tech, which is to fight against enrollment of children in armed groups and contributing to the restoration of security by disarming ex child soldiers and providing them with viable socioeconomic reintegration opportunities in, civil, in civilian life. So, through this application, we intend to reduce by 25% incidents caused by weapons, to increase community confidence, to resettle by 20% of abandoned communities, to relaunch of um, informal trade and uh, production activities, to increase reintegration of children and youth, and also to revive political activities, and uh, finally to reduce by 25% risks of conflict in sensitive areas. So here we had um, a network with children rights, disarmament, mobilization, and reintegration technology with um, religious leaders, as you can see on this image. Yeah, we were organizing a press conference to showcase the outcomes of the project Silence the Gun and to announce the GDR tech to children and adults. So to conclude, I'll conclude by saying that as former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan stated in his 2000 report on children and armed conflict, children depend even more than adults do on the protection afforded in peacetime by family, society, and law. So the international laws as they exist currently are inadequate to protect all African children in conflict situation and more effective means to reinforce are also needed. Children are key stakeholders and are capable to drive societal transformation. So we must invest in them to foster democracy, human rights, and peace. So the finalization of the DDR tech will be an important step towards our vision. We are open to all partnerships that may help to overcome our technical and financial difficulties and contribution to the effective implementation of the DDR tech. Important than what the guys say. If you believe that being different is a richness and not a danger, if you know how to look at each other with the touch of love, if for you the other is first of all your brother, and if anger is for you a weakness and not a proof of strength, then peace will come. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Davina so much for the extremely educational presentation and for showing us how interconnected these issues are. It just makes my heart so happy to see this many young people involved in all of your programs. Um, but so on the note of interconnectedness, I'd like to welcome our final speaker of this panel. Uh, that is Ms. Marie Claire Graf from Switzerland. Um, she is an extremely capable young woman, um, the president of the Swiss Association of Student Organizations for Sustainability, and also the leader of Swiss Youth Climate Strikes and uh, Youth President Representative. So, Marie Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Wanda, for the nice introduction and everyone who was speaking before and everyone who is here. Um, I might not be the most typical speaker at this panel because as already mentioned, I'm coming from the climate and sustainability field. So I was working a lot to build momentum around um, the climate crisis on different levels, very locally. And um, we already saw some pictures, uh, but also on a national level and then also of course on an international UN level. But nevertheless, there are a lot of connections as we have been already seeing. And also I'm really sad that we can't meet because a year ago we met in Basel or at least some of us met in Basel. But I mean, the, let's focus on, on, on the great things. We can be very, very international and have a lot of different um, people here on the panel. So um, maybe I'm just starting very quickly um, before diving into the solutions I am seeing when um, have to deal with the climate and the nuclear crisis, um, stating very, very quickly the problem and where I do see great um, connections between um, climate and nuclear. And then like, yeah, let's focus on the solutions because I think we are all aware of, of the problems already. But I often um, describe the, the climate crisis as a slow moving 
weapon of mass destruction. Um, we know these words from the nuclear disarmament movement. And then people are sometimes a little bit confused. Um, but I mean, let's face it, we are in a climate crisis. It's the biggest challenge humanity has been facing. It's an existential crisis. Um, I mean, science is saying that life on Earth will no longer be possible as we know it today if you are not doing drastic changes in the next eight to 10 years. Um, it's not only the climate, of course, there's also the biodiversity aspect of it and, and many others. Um, but I think it's a good comparison to um, the nuclear one, which is a very fast moving um, weapon of mass destruction. And then we have the climate, which is going slowlier, but it doesn't mean that it's less devastating. Um, so both of these crises or both these threats can end humanity and destroy our planet as we know it today. It can eradicate um, human life, but also the problems are rooted very systemically. They're also rooted in um, privilege and colonial history and the present, and both need a very global response. Um, trying to say, oh, you can climate change when you're changing your diet, and maybe you should just fly a little bit less and then the climate will be happy. I mean, this is not going to solve a crisis. It's the same, I mean, like, I as a person, of course, can try, as we have already been seeing, something to lower the risk of, um, of a nuclear threat. But we cannot end it by a person ourselves. We need movement, but also we need a global response from the leaders who are responsible um, and in power positions. And these are unfortunately, in most cases, not young people. I mean, in fact, they're actually very, very old people. That's why we have to work together to bridge this because again, we don't have much time and um, both can like nuclear, but also the, the climate crisis. We have so-called um, tipping points um, where we have a reinforcing um, threat and we cannot stop it anymore. So we need to work together. And um, I think this is also great what, what we have here on the panel that we have people from different generations with different views and different backgrounds. Um, yeah, that we can, we can try to work together um, to end the fossil fuel area, but also end the nuclear area and hopefully work towards a more peaceful world. But let's focus on the solutions now. I think this is way more exciting. Um, so I am sure that you're, of course, all aware of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but maybe you're not yet aware of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, actually, some climate strikers and um, other people who are standing up for, for more climate protection have been inspired by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and have been thinking, how can we eradicate the root cause. So not only doing some politics which like limiting the rise of temperature and maybe do something, adapt a little bit and mitigate a little bit, but how can we really make a change which um, will eradicate the, the big problem, which um, I mean, there's of course not only the fossil fuel, um, I mean, for climate, for the climate um, gases, there's not, for, of course, not only the fossil fuel, but how can we end one of the major contributor to the climate crisis. And so they are like the three points, like the non-proliferation, disarmament, and then the peaceful development. And they have also been then inspiring the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which aims to end fossil fuels in all its forms. So the first one is to end any coal, oil, gas production, but also um, the, all the infrastructure around it. As you might be aware, there is still today, it's very ridiculous, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of money going into this very, very old fashioned form um, of, of energy production. And um, so this is the first demand. And the second one is that we are facing out all the existing um, stockpiles that like really like the, we can really get off everything. It means um, the investments into it, but also the old, like the plan and the decisions um, we made into the um, establishment of, for example, the, the pipelines. There is also a lot of human rights and especially also indigenous um, issues come with it. Maybe you have heard that um, Joe Biden tomorrow um, will reject one of the big pipelines going through um, a holy and um, indigenous land. So there is a lot of other issues, of course, related to it. And then the last one is moving to renewable energies and um, like um, supporting also a decentralized localized system because very often these fossil fuels infrastructures 
are very um, big and heavy and, and dominated by either by companies or by the government, but they are in, in most cases not really supporting local people in the villages um, where they actually need the electricity and very often it also comes to, to shutdowns or whatever, um, so the local people cannot really help themselves and are hence dependent on this, in, on this national or big um, corporate structures. So this is one of the solutions I'm very, very excited and that's also where I see one of the big possibilities to collaborate because we can learn a lot from the movement um, around nuclear and I think in reverse um, there is also some learnings um, from, from the climate movement because while nuclear bombs are very scary so most people when, when we talk about nuclear like um, maybe in a classroom or in the family people are like very quickly very scared but then somehow when we talk about climate um, despite it's very I mean very frustrating and very very I mean, I'm very afraid of, of the consequence of the climate crisis. People are not yet so afraid because the effects are here, but maybe not like in their backyard um, or not their families yet um, hit. Well, we probably all know some people who have already been experiencing the effects of the climate crisis um, all around the world. Um, they are not seeing the climate crisis yet as such a scary thing as they see, for example, nuclear bombs or, or, or other um, nuclear weapons. So I think there we can learn more about how we um, put the narrative around this um, to not scare people, but make people aware that, again, as I mentioned in the intro, it's a slow moving weapon of mass destruction, which is in no means better than a fast moving one. And I think the second one is really to this, for example, the, non -fossil, fuel, uh, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that we are focusing on the root causes. Because we have been seeing now for around 30 years negotiations in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change at the UN on different other levels, um, where I'm also part of, um, and, and many other young people as well, where we are trying to limit and reduce and tweak it a little bit around but of course, we're saying we have to end fossil fuels, but we don't really have something like a treaty or something um, where we can really push where young people can go to the government and push for it and where we can also build a movement around it. So I think there we can also learn a lot on how we can set up something um, which is really tackling the root causes instead of only doing some superficial um, makeup policies. And then also the last one, I think, is really about the... Um, growing um, in a horizontal way. I mean, we have been seeing young people striking all over the world, and I hope that many of you have been part of it. Um, I mean, not now, but about a year ago um, or, or, or more, um, like two years ago. Uh, but that we also growing in a, in a horizontal way, meaning that we incorporate more of the different topics and that we have, for example, more collaborations with um, movements on, on nuclear disarmament um, but also other other um, related issues through it, because as I mentioned before, and as you have also been hearing in the former um, in the former um, two talks, that unless you're tackling the very very basic root causes, it's nearly impossible to um, to end the issue completely. Um, so I would love to see more collaboration between the two movements and also more understanding because I can imagine if I am joining one of the conferences you're probably understanding everything but for me this will be very challenging and I hope that we have more common understanding and supporting and um, also strengthening these exchanges that um, people from the, the nuclear disarmament area are maybe joining the, the climate change conference that we can do some common learning and also in reverse that um, young people from the um, climate and environmental sphere biodiversity sphere are joining other um, other negotiations or, or um, political discussions, or as well, of course, when whenever possible, again, um, some some actions on the streets or, or in schools. But also that when we are communicating, that we are communicating both issues together, that we can do some cross links and make people aware that while we are talking about one of these international mass destructions and and one of the biggest problems on earth, that there are also others. And with this, I'm ending and looking very much forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, thank you so much. And you said at the beginning that you might not be the typical speaker in this setting, but I'm so happy that we're making the connections here between climate and nuclear disarmament. And you know, similarly to like with the sustainable development goals, the motto is to leave no one behind. So similarly, we 
cannot and should not be focusing just on nuclear disarmament and forget about climate change or vice versa. So I'm happy that um, we can make these connections here. Um, so with this, I would like to thank all of our speakers for their wonderful presentations. And we do have about 15 minutes that we can spend on the actual dialogue. Um, so I'd like to ask the speakers to open the Q&A boxes because there you can find the questions that our participants have been asking. And I think we can do two rounds of questions if we have the time for that. And I'd like to start with Marjan um, with a question. Um, there's one from Esther and I'm gonna read them out loud for the people who are watching over on social media uh, that don't see the, the actual questions over here in Zoom. So the question is, Marjan, uh, thanks so much for your presentation, first of all. And do you think it is possible to overcome generation gap when we witness so much radicalization by the youth today in our countries? Thank you, Vanda, and thank you for the question uh, from the participant. Um, I think uh, one of the fundamental issues, uh, which I have not really uh, talked much about in my presentation due to the limited time, uh, is uh, the peace education, as well as disarmament education as uh, a component of it, or uh, rather uh, being uh, introduced jointly. So as we know, uh, in 2019, uh, I think Italy became the first country to include the, into their education curriculum um, a class on uh, sustainable development as well as uh, climate. And I think this could serve um, as a primary example of uh, how we can uh, raise awareness as well as uh, prevent radicalization of young people from the perspective of uh, education and how peace education uh, combines the aspects of uh, positive peace as well as negative peace, but mainly um, contributing to the formation of the positive peace aspect, which is um, uh, geared towards uh, creation of the um, justice, uh, harmony, uh, as well as uh, uh, more, um, more peace uh, and peaceful coexistence. And of course, depending uh, on the context that we are speaking about, on the regional differences, uh, I still believe that the key uh, and uh, possible solution would be uh, peace education, disarmament education, uh, which uh, is bringing up uh, different types of issues as well as um, uh, topics uh, covering um, ranging from um, peace, climate, um, nuclear arms, and et cetera. But I think uh, in general, the inclusion of arms, uh, no matter which types of arms, um, is something which is lacking uh, in the education curriculum and the general education, yeah. Thank you so much, Marjan. You're you're absolutely you're absolutely right. Um, so, uh, second question from the Q and A box will go to Davina. Um, I'm gonna again read it out loud. Uh, thank you, Davina. Very impressive. And now I know that um, this question has already been partially answered in the in the chat, but I think it's great, so it should also be set here out loud uh, for those who are not in the chat. Um, so, if you could just share. Um, the area of coverage for your projects. Um, Esther here is asking in relation to the uh, project locations, given that uh, they're deep and serious conflict in some of the regions in Cameroon. Um, so if you could just address that. And also there's a question whether you'd be open to share experiences with other youth who have not heard about your projects. But I think this is precisely what you're doing here right now. Uh, but so if you could just, um, answer the question on the areas of coverage. Thanks. Uh, so my area of coverage is in the whole Africa, uh, precisely in the Central African. And there are also many countries who are mostly affected by the conflicts like Cameroon, Nigeria, Chad, Democracy Republic of Congo. So that, those are the places where I focus more my work on. And uh, for and to share my story to many youths, yeah, 
I can even do that one million times without any problem. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, and finally, question for Marie Claire. Um, do you think uh, that young people campaigning against climate change are sufficiently aware of the dangers of nuclear power, its links to nuclear uh, nuclear weapons, and how badly it will be affected by climate change? Well, actually, I think there is a certain level of awareness, um, and certain people are um, aware of, 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 of both of the, of the threats. But of course, we can, we, we can and we have to increase the level of understanding. I mentioned it at the very end of the presentation that I think that when I or many other people would join one of your conferences, and we would also be lost in the jargons and in the abbreviations, in the wording and so on. So I think there needs to be a, loss, a lot of education um, and the capacity building within our own movements um, and also openness to talk about different issues, also be open that we maybe are experts in one field, but not yet experts, but we are, um, but we want to learn in other fields. So I think it's very important and it's good that we have groups who are already established in, in both areas, because I think these bridge builders are very important to initiate and seed um, some starting points where then other people can join. And I think a lot of people are joining one particular issue. Um, for myself, it was actually rather about nature protection. Others maybe started about um, women equality or, or girls equality. Others started with education. But then we can grow and experience and learn more. And I think it's very important that we have this space and this understanding of people um, and, and common capacity building. But yeah, to answer, no, there is not yet enough awareness, but let's work on it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, all right, another question for Marjan. Um, again, it's from the it's from the Q and A. Uh, so, um, what are you doing to engage nuclear uh, superpowers that make the world terrible, and how do you engage the nuclear fathers and protagonists to stop nuclear buildups? It's a complex question. There you go. Yeah. Um... There are actually different ways uh, of um, tackling these issues, especially in uh, nuclear armed states. Um, and I can even share my screen, uh, but I would uh, just mention one of them, uh, which we are uh, working on, is the issue of the economic justice uh, and the nuclear divestment. So as we know, um, the nuclear weapons budget for the next decade uh, is equal to one trillion uh, US dollars. And um, those um, expenses could be actually redirected towards the achievement of sustainable development goals, uh, towards uh, public health, towards uh, coping with the issue of climate crisis, and many more, ending the poverty, hunger. But for some reason, those weapons are being kept uh, to actually maintain and modernize nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the budget is uh, quite uh, impressive. And here I would like to mention the international campaign, which is called Move the Nuclear Weapons Money, which is exactly meant uh, at cutting nuclear weapons budget, uh, at uh, informing uh, and um, encouraging uh, the nuclear divestment policies. Uh, and we know that uh, there are different entities which are uh, part of um, the nuclear weapons industry contributing to it um, either um, consciously or unconsciously. For example, uh, cities, uh, universities, uh, religious institutions, uh, of course, mainly the nuclear weapons um, uh, producing um, corporations and industries um, and banks and all of this um, uh, depicts us uh, towards the systematic view of how actually nuclear weapons are being financially supported and how we on different levels uh, and on different entities can um, actually fight this issue. Uh, and uh, there is also um, a study called Don't Bank on the, um, Don't Bank on the Bomb, uh, which is um, providing a list uh, of the banks which are contributing towards the uh, production of nuclear weapons. And depending on where you are, uh, you can check uh, your uh, bank if it's 
also in the list uh, and um, change your uh, bank account or actually um, reach out to the managers um, of those uh, banks. Yeah. And um, also the same goes for the uh, students. Uh, you can also check whether your university is uh, somehow um, funding the nuclear weapons industry or even the fossil fuels. Uh, and there is an organization called uh, 350.org, which is uh, actually intended uh, on the fossil fuels problem. And um, yeah, I can go on, of course, but uh, there are different ways. And I can also uh, share uh, my screen uh, quickly um, if I still have time. <laughs> Uh, and uh, here you can see also different ways of uh, how you can uh, actually influence the nuclear uh, armed states. Um, I hope you can see it. Uh, this was uh, taken from the uh, study by Rydell, who uh, provided uh, 10 ways in which um, initiatives to advance uh, nuclear disarmament uh, are exemplified. And uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can take a look or take a photo of that. Uh, and um, like the majority of part of this is also connected to actually uh, education and outreach uh, and encouraging more studies and research uh, towards the issue of uh, nuclear weapons. Thanks. All right, lovely. Thank you. Um, so final question for Davina, um, again from the Q&A. Um, how much do you engage the UNSCR 2020-50 in your work? Uh, that is the resolution on youth peace and security. Um, if you could just quickly comment on that. So for the UNSCR 20-50, Simply, we engage it by the numerous strategies my mate and I have been carrying on the field, that is the sensitizations, awareness raising campaigns, educational discussions um, on the question of early marriage, um, the creation and distribution of peace cartoons. Um, we have also the creation of peace clubs and many other stuff. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. So looking at the Q&A, uh, I think we've answered most of the questions there. Um, there is one final question that I'm going to leave open to all of the panelists. Uh, if anyone would like to address the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is coming into force on Friday. Um, just really quickly before we run out of time, if there's anyone who would like to address that. Nope. All right. <laughs> uh, well, good thing is that uh, we're going to leave the stream open so that if you still have some questions there that you'd like to answer and type it in, you can absolutely do that even over the break. And then the participants can read them, read them during the break or at the beginning of the next panel or um, whenever. So with this, uh, I'd like to bring the first panel to a close. We will now take a 15 minute break so that everyone can go and get some coffee and stretch their legs. But we will reconvene at 4.30 Central European time for session two, which will be chaired by the amazing Michaela Sorensen, the former chair, hello, <laughs> the former chair of the UN Youth Association of Denmark and the current program assistant at Youth Fusion. Um, that'll be it from me. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here and um, I'll see you in 15 minutes. Great. Thanks. <laughs>